What's up everybody, how's it going? Today I've got a super special guest here. This is Antoine Porsche. He is my co-founder on Algo Expert. You may have seen him on the Meet the Team page on Algo Expert, but you probably haven't seen him on any video online because he hasn't really made a public appearance up until now. But so why don't you introduce yourself, Antoine? So as Colin said, I'm Antoine. I've been at Algo Expert basically since Colin pitched me the idea some two and a half years ago now. I've been working at Uber for around two years and I'm on the infrastructure team. And so for those of you who don't know, I work on scaling up and deploying and building all the software that the engineers you know build at uber and so today we're going to be talking specifically about what it really takes to build a business namely an online business an online product and so we're going to try to kind of explore all the back-end services that we have on algo expert which you've primarily been building and kind of giving you an insight into that how it all works so Anton, why don't you start by telling us about you know, the, the various backend services that we yeah. have on Algo Expert. So basically the first service that we need to have on Algo Expert, besides obviously like the UI, was a way for people to log in on Algo Expert. So this is also called authentication. The first way that we could have done it would be to essentially have a kind of like username and password sort of thing where right. people sign up or register uh, either with their email address or with a username and, and their own creative password. The problem is that you kind of have to store that in a very secure manner in, in the database. And there's uh, encryption that needs to go into, into the mix. And quite frankly, we didn't really want to have to deal with that. That was just like way too much overhead that we didn't need to, to have to hear. Noise. Yeah, that, and, and also people don't want, you know, and yet another website, yet another password to have to remember. So we use this thing called OAuth. And essentially it's a way for us to leverage Google or GitHub or Facebook and a lot of other platforms have it now, where essentially we're not storing anything and we're just kind of using Google or GitHub as just an authentication mechanism and, and these services tell us who you are, but they don't they don't have to tell us anything about what your password is or what your email is. Right, and so I, I think the, the point to get across here is that these days if you're trying to create a business, something like OAuth allows you to create authentication that's secure and everything so simply without having to do all this overhead stuff, creating your own authentication system. And we get occasionally a few people who ask us, why don't you allow, you know, just username and password? And it's kind of like, trust us, it's much better for you to have your Google account do that and Google manage that, which is going to be just far more secure and reliable than have us do it. Yeah. But so that was the first backend service. So what's another backend service that we have on, on Algo Expert? So uh, essentially when you go on an Algo Expert, really like our bread and butter are the questions. Yep. Right? Basically we have right now 75 questions that you can access and different questions have different categories. They have different difficulties yep. and all the questions have prompts. Uh, they have some hints, they have our solutions, they have some tests, right. right? And so we need a way to store that and to retrieve that uh, essentially from a database. And so we have our uh, problem service, which deals with all of what I just talked about. It's essentially our content delivery mechanism. Yeah, so that's basically, if you the user go on Algo Expert to the questions list, so algoexpert.io slash questions, we are making some API call to this problem service that gives us the list of questions. And then on an individual question, same thing, an API call that gives us all the individual question information and so on and so forth. Right, and, and so also another thing that the problem service does, and it, it needs to basically cater the content to you, right? If you haven't right. bought Algo Expert, it needs to give you a, some questions, but not others, right? right? So you can't really access the questions that you've been paid for. Uh, and that's kind of goes hand in hand with something called authorization, which again is like kind of part of the authentication, but also slightly different. It's basically managing who can see what, who has access to what. And then also to the point that you made about it being tailored to the user beyond accessibility or authorization, it's also what, which questions have you completed? Right. Basically like save user data. What are your solutions that you've already typed on, uh, on Algo Expert? Because we save all that data and we kind of store it somewhere in that service. But so what's the next service that we have? Well, so the next, I think, big thing for us was actually integrating with a, with a, a payment system, essentially right. having the ability f to make money, right? And as any online business, you're going to want to take 
debit cards. You're going to want to take credit cards. Right. You might even want some PayPal. But so essentially we have, again, a, back, a payments backend service that uh, it's kind of a gateway for the UI to use all these kind of like third party systems like Stripe for your debit and credit cards and PayPal for your PayPal account. Or you can also use your bank account, for example, on right. PayPal. But essentially that service just takes care of all of this and makes it really, really easy for the UI to basically charge a user and immediately have the user have access to all the questions. But I think that this is another good example where if we had been in the business of creating our own payment processor, that would have been a ton of work, so much you know, security and privacy stuff involved. So instead, we do have a payment service but that sort of directs or links to these much more established businesses like Stripe or PayPal. Right, and it's, it, it's kind of the same thing as for authentication, where we didn't want to store usernames and passwords. Here, we definitely don't want to store your credit card information. That's, right. that's, we want to get far away from that because it has all sorts of regulations. So we use Stripe because it essentially takes care of managing that information for us. Exactly. And by the way, Stripe, we are in no way affiliated to Stripe, but what a fantastic product. Yeah, as, as a backend engineer, I, I definitely can recommend Stripe. If you're going to be integrating with a payment system, there are quite a few options out there Stripe has been amazing. Even I, as a front-end engineer, they, they offer front-end elements and all that, and it's just a great sort of like API surface. It's just really, really a great product. It's a, yeah, it's a great service, great product. So now we get into one of the back-end services that I think is probably the, the most exciting about our platform, which is uh, what we call the RCE, the remote code execution. So why don't right. you tell us a bit about that? So on Algo Expert, we have a really key feature to our platform, and it's that people can run their solutions to our algorithms against our own test cases right. directly on the website. Right. They, you, you don't even have to kind of go into your terminal or open uh, a code editor or any of that. We basically have everything integrated into our platform and we allow you to run the code there directly on the web page. It was always kind of a, a hard problem to solve because at the end of the day, you don't want someone who's executing their code to be able to take down it. Right? And when you give this kind of remote code execution ability to the average user, to someone anywhere on the globe, you kind of expose yourself to, to some potential problems. But so our remote code execution, we built it in-house, even though there were third parties, because at the start, especially, we wanted to save a lot of money. Right. And all these third party systems happen to be really, really expensive. And not necessarily fully tailored to sort of what we needed. Because yeah. we were kind of writing our own, we wanted to, we wanted users to be able to run tests on the platform, right? So we needed to run our own sort of custom test suites in various programming languages. And it wasn't, you know, clear that other businesses or, you know, service providers in this, in this industry could give us what we needed. Right. And we also wanted speed, right? It's so speed. a lot of the third party kind of services that we could have used uh, happen to be really slow uh, for language like Java, especially. You're looking at you know anywhere from four to six seconds from when you click the run code to when you get the output, and we just thought that was really subpar uh, user experience. So I think the the key thing to take away here maybe is that while there are some cases like authentication or payments where you don't want to reinvent the wheel and you really do want to use some other party's product. There are some cases where that's not really the case. That's a redundancy there. But in the case of the remote code execution, it was just smarter for us to re-implement what may have already existed out there. Right. right. Both financially and from a product point of view and you know right. specification point of view. So all the services that we just mentioned are services that our users interact with every day. They log in, they pay, they run code. Are there other backend services that we have that are sort of internal only or that users might not be privy to. So one of the first things that I decided to do when uh, A started kind of picking up in terms of traffic, in terms of revenue, in terms of sales, right, was uh, to write a kind of continuous testing service, essentially something that would really allow me to sleep well at night, right. knowing that the API that I was writing on the back end was actually performing, was working, was available. Right. So that essentially wouldn't, we wouldn't have something really bad breaking uh, for all of our users right. while I was sleeping and not be notified about it. 
Because the last thing that we would want is for users to go on AlgoExpert.io on the questions list page and not get anything, or maybe try to run code and not get anything back. That's exactly it. And so essentially all of that service does is it basically sits in the loop and just tests a whole bunch of functionality right. directly using the API. So it doesn't actually use the UI, but it makes it exercises the same code path, the same functionality that the UI uses, right. and essentially makes sure that people can log in. It makes sure that you know people can pay, make sure that people can see the question list, uh, and basically allows me to sleep well at night. So basically it's sort of a, an infinite or continuous testing service for the API. Right. It's not an end-to-end -end test because we are not uh, you know, opening up algoexpert.io in the browser and replicating clicks and stuff like that, but it is testing the entire API, which is fantastic. So there's one more backend service that I think None of our users are aware even exists, but that I particularly like, and that you basically built from scratch. What is this one? So it's essentially uh, a service that we call Jarvis. And basically, I wrote that to make sure that whenever we pushed any changes to our algorithms and to our solutions, uh, we still pass our own tests, yep. right? We don't want anybody to go on AlgoExpert.io to run our solution and see that there's an error there. That's yep. the last thing we want. So uh, essentially what Jarvis does is it listens to uh, new pull requests that we have on GitHub and essentially figures out, okay, what has changed in this particular pull request? And depending on what changed, it will test different things. And so depending on what algorithm we changed in that pull request, we will test the algorithm against our solution to make sure that everything is still working. So as an example, sometimes we get some of our users who are super nice, by the way, and are, are kind enough to send us feedback and tell us, hey, I think you have a typo in this problem, or you, know, you could have used a hash map instead of a, an array or something like that. And we take that advice to heart, and sometimes we fix these problems, and this Jarvis service will basically immediately run all of the problems on, algorithm, on Algo Expert immediately, right? Without having us needing to do it manually. Right, right. And so it makes sure that whenever we merge something into our master branch before deploying it, which by the way, Jarvis also takes care of, right. we know that things are gonna be correct. So to, to the point that he just made, what Jarvis also does is when we merge a commit to master, meaning we've made a change in the code, whether it be related to problems or something else like the user interface, and we merge that into the master branch, Jarvis will immediately run all the tests, make sure that everything's passing, and if everything is passing, it'll deploy the necessary services. Right now we mostly do, I think, the UI, the user interface. It'll automatically deploy them to our QA and staging environments so that we can sort of like instantly see our changes in our testing environments, if that makes sense. Right. And it's just super useful. It's been incredibly useful for us. And again, this is not something that does not exist out there. There are lots of other sort of real business products and companies that have tools like this. But for us, it just didn't make sense to go and spend a ton of money on these services because we only sort of incrementally started to need this particular service and we were able to just build it from the ground up, tailor it to our own needs, and it just works out perfectly for us. Exactly. So that's gonna be it for this video. I really hope that you found it insightful. Hopefully it kind of gave you an idea of how a real business can be built, at least from the backend perspective. Let me know in the comments what you thought about this. Let me know if you'd like to see the same video, maybe for the UI or for something else about the business. And uh, don't forget to smash the like button for Antoine. Do it for Antoine, it will make him happy. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And Antoine, any last words? Thanks for having me, Clint. Thanks for being here.